Uh, and I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk today. Um, it's very nice to come to a place where uh, I haven't been and meet a lot of people and see a room full. Um, the first time I gave an artist talk was about five years ago, um, and I was fretting about it. I had to prepare and do all these things. It was in St. Louis, and um, the people in attendance were the gallery owner and her husband and her best friend and some random guy that had been walking down the street who came in. <laughs> and I suspect they paid him to come in. Uh, so including the owners, there were four people there. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was a lesson for me in marketing, uh, but I have a, uh, a firm belief that in art, particularly in glass art, uh, there is no such thing as failure. There is success and there's learning. Um, or to put it a different way, if you're not failing, you're not learning. Okay? Um, so I create uh, pieces like this. Um, this is a, a pair of uh, pieces, one called yellow trees, one called red trees. And I call them hand-painted, multi-layered, fused glass panels. That's my official name for this. I wish I could come up with an Italian word, a single word, like, you know, scraffito or some kind of term that would encapsulate that. And um, I don't know any words like that. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, talk a little bit about the glass, talk a little bit about the process, and kind of walk you through, walk you through all this. So my background, I grew up in a city called Detroit, the, the motor city of the U.S. It's an industrial town. But I spent a lot of my time in northern Michigan, which is all forested and not, not very well populated. Um, and I used to go camping and canoeing, but wherever I went, I would take long walks through the forest. And that was really uh, where I felt most at home. Um, and uh, even when I went to uh, university, I went to the Uni University of Michigan, I continued to take walks. I, it wasn't a heavily wooded area, but if I had a morning free, say I had four hours free, I would pick a direction that I'd never walked in. I would walk for two hours and turn around and walk back just to explore. And in that period of time, I would get beyond the city limits and, and find something. Uh, also, when I was young, I was very involved in music. You can see me playing the piano. I was a very nerdy-looking kid. Um, I also ended up playing uh, church organ, and I sang in a lot of different kind of chorales and things. So uh, music was a big part of my life. And when I went to university, I had to decide whether I wanted to study music or study something more practical, uh, like engineering. Um, and I, I chose the engineering track. I had talked with some musicians, and they described their life. And um, it's it, like... The, the, the guy that taught music at my school said, I get up early and teach private lessons, and then I teach throughout the school day, and then I teach private lessons after school, and then in the evening I'll go home and my wife and I will go to a concert. And I thought, that's a little bit too much music for me. Um, I studied computers and I went into information technology or IT as a career. Uh, I stayed in Ann Arbor. Um, Michigan, which is where the university was. Um, I got married and I raised four great kids. Um, this is my second oldest graduation. Um, this is an important uh, photo in terms of my history because my children were 19, 18, um, 15, and 13. So I officially had four teenagers in the house at one time. And for mental health reasons, I had to find a way to get out of the house. Um, and so I started taking drawing and paint and watercolor painting classes. That was just kind of my outlet. So I'd been involved in music, um, kind of midlife. I, I just uh, picked another art form. And I, I have always felt like I needed some kind of creative outlet for sanity's sake. 
and those painting skills came back and helped me later. About that same time, I started uh, falling in love with glass. And in Michigan, the galleries tended to have something every spring called Michigan Glass Month. And the galleries would feature glass artists. And just through that and through wandering into galleries, I started really loving glass. I remember the first piece of glass that made my jaw drop to the floor. Uh, I still remember it very vividly. And I'll, I'll come back to that story a little bit later. So I started learning about glass and collecting, you know, small pieces, uh, uh, generally inexpensive things. But it started my, uh, my interest in glass. Um, in the late 90s, I started having a lot of personal difficulties. And uh, I just was struggling with life, and I felt my, like my life was falling apart. Um, and I didn't, at first, really understand what I was struggling with. I, um, I came to the point where I had to start being honest with myself, and, uh, which is something I hadn't really done up to that point, and I, I came out as, as a gay man. Um, it was a very, very difficult struggle because of the environment I was in. I, I was married with four kids. I was in a very religious uh, community. I had, think I had probably joined a religious community to help you know, avoid the truth in some ways. Um, a lot of things started to change. Um, in 2001, I divorced and moved back to Detroit. And a year later met uh, this guy, uh, Bob, who uh, is now my husband. Wasn't possible back then, but we've been together for about 15 years. Um, and a year after that, which was my, the first birthday that after we had met, um, for a birthday present, my 50th birthday, he bought a, a torchwork class for me. And we had visited a studio that spring as part of Michigan Glass Month, which I continued to support. Um, and I had been talking with this artist who happened to mention that he did private classes. And it, that went way over my head. I'd never ever con conceived that I could actually create the glass. I only was someone that appreciated it. Uh, so I took this tor torchwork class and I, I just was enamored with the fact that I could actually manipulate glass. Um, so at that time I, I, I knew enough about glass. I divided the world of glass into torchwork, uh, hot glass, uh, warm glass, or fused glass, and casting, those four areas. So I took, uh, after the torchwork class, I took a class in glass blowing in the middle of the summer, which is not a good time to do it. Um, and uh, about that time, we ended up moving to Chicago. Um, and then in Chicago, I uh, met um, someone who had turned their garage into a fusing studio. So I took a fusing class. And my, my plan was to take a class at all four of those disciplines, and then kind of decide what I wanted to do with it. Um, and after the fusing class was over, I said, can I come back and kind of do some things on my own? And he said, sure. So I kind of basically rented studio time from him. Um, and I have yet to take the casting class. Um, I kind of felt like I found my niche and uh, have stayed there. When I was in Ann Arbor, I, I was still working in IT. I worked for Domino's Pizza, the world headquarters. I, I used to enjoy telling my kids' friends that I worked for Domino's. And I wouldn't say anything else. And I let them figure out, did I make the pizzas or did I <laughs> deliver them? Uh, but the move to Chicago, um, I began working for the McDonald's Corporation. Uh, so my specialty in IT was kind of fast food, point of sale, all that kind of technology. And um, a lot of people, I think, in life go, th go through their career feeling like they work for a clown sometimes. And I really did work for the clown. So, but, uh, so I moved to Chicago um, and, and just started um, doing more with fused glass. Um, and I, you know, did some simple things. I, for a while, I was making these large bowls, uh, kind of decorative bowls that were very shallow, but... Uh, I got a lot of comments on them. I did not get a lot of sales. Um, and 
uh, it challenged me to think about um, what it meant to be an artist. And um, I'll, I'll come back to that. But I, essentially, my, uh, my hobby, as it was, was turning into, started to grow. I uh, applied to an art show just to see what would happen. And I was accepted in, um, kind of to my surprise. Uh, and one of the things you had to do to apply for this art show is you had to show pictures of your work and you had to show a picture of your booth. Well, I didn't have a, I didn't have a tent. I didn't have anything. So, uh, so to apply, I had to go buy a tent and I was going to put it, I lived in a condo building and the bottom floor was an under, underground garage. So we were going to set up the tent and we we're going to take a picture. Because it, it, it was again... Uh, the middle of winter when in the U.S. when you apply for art for summer art fairs, and so we got it down there and we tried to set up the tent and it turns out as you expanded the tent the top went up, and the ceiling wasn't high enough, so we ended up having to shorten the legs so we could expand it to its full size, but the top of the tent was about here, so I took some bricks and I put a a door on the bricks so that the table surface was only about that far above the ground. We covered it with a tablecloth. I put my glass. Uh, Bob knelt down behind the table. <laughs> I lay down on the floor and took some photos. And it looked just like a booth in an art fair. And, and it actually got me in. Uh, that first art fair, the, I'm trying to do the conversion, the booth fee was about 300 pounds. And I sold 330 pounds worth of glass. Um, so I just barely made my booth fee. But I, it was, I was excited to, to do that. Um, and it gave me a lot of um, time, uh, not time, it, it, it got me thinking about doing this more seriously. Um, and right about that time, uh, Bob retired. He's seven years older than I am. Uh, he retired, and I said, I don't want to wait until I'm full retirement age to get out of IT. And I said, I'm going to try to figure out if I can do glass full time. It would give me more flexibility. And uh, So being uh, kind of an engineer, being kind of a planner, um, I wrote a seven-year business plan that said at the end of seven years, I would quit my IT job. I would move someplace warm, because I always hated the snow in Michigan and Chicago, and I would do art full time. Uh, and I had really not a, a real big clue on how, how to get there. But the, the process of writing a business plan forced me to figure that out. I had to set goals for myself, so every year I had goals. I kind of thought about what would it mean to be a full time artist in seven years. And then I kind of worked my way back, and each year I had certain milestones of things I needed to be able to accomplish. And I had sales goals and, you know, that, that whole, it was a formal business plan. Uh, and it, it, it actually was, was very, very helpful. And seven years and two weeks later, we moved from Chicago to Southern California. Um, which, uh, so this is, uh, I live right outside of Palm Springs. It's desert, lots of palm trees, lots of snow-covered mountains in the background. It's, it's beautiful in the winter. It's hotter than blazes in the summer. I was telling some people the, uh, it usually doesn't get as hot as, it, it, you know, it's not, June is not the hottest month, but tomorrow it's going to be 49 degrees Celsius. We moved so close to the, the end of that business plan. We basically moved right on schedule. That I looked back and I said, maybe I should have written a five-year business plan. Um, but I actually think seven years was, was the right amount of process for that. To go from where I was, which is really a hobbyist, to, to being a full-time artist, it, it did take some time and effort. But my uh, career has continued to build. I'm currently represented in uh, eight different galleries in the U.S., my goal is to build that up to about 10 to 12 galleries, which I think is probably about the right level so that my sales are where I want them to be, but I'm not uh, kind of killing myself trying to keep 
uh, keep everyone supplied. And in 2014, I began teaching. Um, and so I've taught pretty extensively in the US. Uh, last year, I taught in uh, Mexico. And uh, uh, part of this trip is I'll be teaching uh, here in the UK. Teaching part wasn't uh, formally part of my business plan. Um, but I have found that uh, it is, uh, it's a very good thing for me to do because I, every time I teach a class, I learn something, number one, for my students. And my own practice is improved because students will say, why do you do it that way? Wouldn't it be easier if you did it this way? And I go, yeah, it would be. Um, so I, I, I do learn from teaching, um, and it, it, it is uh, a good a kind of marketing component. It helps um, build, if you call it, brand awareness. So I've got, I've got studios like Creative Glass Guild kind of promoting me and my work, uh, and that's been, uh, that's been a really helpful thing. Um, so for me, uh, first having kind of an engineering technical background, and then uh, coming later in life into art uh, has been a very important, very uh, significant kind of combination. Um, I don't have a fine art degree. I, you know, uh, when I talk to people that are really fine art people, they kind of catch on pretty quickly. I, I don't know the names I should know and the, the art periods and all that stuff. And to some degree, in the, particularly in the better galleries, that, it, that can be an impediment in some cases. There are some galleries that won't even talk to you if you don't have an art degree. Uh, but there's so many other things where doors have opened for me. Um, and uh, I, I realized early on I would probably never have the opportunity to go back to school and get an art degree. And I knew I would have to survive on more than my charm and my good looks. Um, so I, I, uh, I had to learn marketing uh, through failures like that one talk and, and many, many other marketing failures that I've had. I've, I've learned something about, um, about marketing, about promoting yourself, and, and combining both uh, kind of a technical or a business background with an art background. And so we talk about the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And being able to balance those two things, I think, is very helpful. Um, and I see my passion as partly a creative endeavor and partly a business endeavor. And I don't think all artists approach their career as a business, which, which I believe you should. Um, you can create the best art, but if you don't know how to market, if you don't know how to approach galleries, um, then uh, you're kind of landlocked in a certain sense. Um, I also feel that coming late in life uh, has had some advantages, some advantages because I've got a lot of life experiences, um, some of them very good and some of them very difficult. Um, and, and I bring that in a, in a certain sense, I think, in, into my, my work. Um, I know I'm not... You know, I'm not 21 years old starting out. I know I don't have a 50-year art career ahead of me. At least, I hope I don't. Um, although, I, I, I was in Rome a week ago, and I learned that Michelangelo was still sculpting at the age of 89. And the average lifespan at that time was 40. So he, and and it, 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 uh, if you take your youth away from that, most people might have a 20-year adult lifespan. He had a 69-year adult lifespan. So he had the time to create some amazing uh, pieces of art. And I don't think I'll have that much time. I, I don't think I'll live to twice the, the, uh, the average age. So, um, so it makes me have to think about what are my goals and what's really important to me. Um, and uh, so I think I, I tend to be fairly goal-focused and tend to think about really what, it, what is it that will help me in the next 10 to 20 years versus uh, something that I might enjoy doing but is not going to kind of help my, um, my career along. Um, this is a picture of me working in the studio. 
And uh, just kind of as, as a final comment, I, a lot of people who have known me for a while ask me how I like retirement. And I, I don't like that question because I feel like I'm working as hard or maybe harder than I did before. Before I had a paycheck and anything that I was doing with glass, it was just kind of a, a bonus on that. I don't have that paycheck anymore. Um, so uh, it, it really is, um, you know, this is my income, this is my livelihood. Um, and, uh, and again, that, that helps me focus. It, it's, it's no longer a hobby. It's, it's something that's, uh, that I take on very seriously. This is a piece called Around the Bend. Um, when I painted it, it, to me it was just an iconic place I would walk as a kid. You know, road walking through a forest in Michigan, um, and you didn't know where that road necessarily was going. You didn't know what was on the other side of those trees. Um, it's interesting because um, I, I, I I will make a piece uh, several times, often in different sizes or different colors. And this piece has been in a few different galleries. And I, I hear comments all over the place that, oh, th this looks like a place just down the road from where I grew up, but in a completely different part of the country. And I'm looking forward to spending some time walking in Somerset. And my guess is it might look something like this. I, I don't know. I haven't been there yet, but I do see my life as a journey with that road uh, kind of representing the journey. It was a couple years ago, somebody asked me, well, what do your pieces mean? I mean, what, what is that road and, and so forth? And I had never really thought about that specifically. Like, why do I do these? When I looked at my work, I realized almost all my pieces have trees and fog and very often a road. Um, and so uh, I had to think about what, what did that mean for me. On the surface, I think I was just painting what I grew up with and what I loved. I always felt at home walking in the forest. The, the fog is, um, I think, significant. The more I thought about it, the more I realized it's important for me to depict a piece where you can't see what's in the background. You don't know what is out there. And by the way, just in the side, I, I came to the UK specifically to enjoy the fog. <laughs> now, I've been here five days, and there, is, there has been no fog. Um, I'm probably the only tourist that's been disappointed by that fact. Um, but anyway, I'm hoping I'll, I'll catch some some British fog before I go home. But I, I realized that the fog is a metaphor for, not for my life, but for the future. And um, I think the deeper meaning for me is that you don't know what the future holds for you. I never would have guessed, 50 years ago, I figured I would have, you know, I'd be maybe retired, maybe not, I'd be working in IT and I'd have grandchildren running around the house and you know that that's kind of how I imagined my life. I also never thought I'd be married to a dude you know but here I am. I think I think all of us have a road in front of us. All of us have decisions we we have to make. Some of them are very important like who do we marry and what is our career and you know how what kind of lifestyle do I want to live? All, all those kind of big questions. But there's also a lot of simple questions. Um, my decision to come to the UK this summer. Um, I don't know if that will be just a pleasant trip or something more significant. You make decisions all the time without knowing what the final impact of those, those decisions are. And I think that's really, for me, why I started painting these. And I like the idea that you can't see the future. And so my pieces represent that uncertainty in life. And my, my hope is that the people that, that see my work, uh, from them they, get, they feel some kind of courage to face the future or to, to face their decisions. Uh, I, th I think in, um, in, uh, in the in Christian theology, faith is the certainty of things not seen. 
That's the kind of standard definition of what faith is. I think hope is the uncertainty of things not seen. Um, but for me, hope is also optimism, and it's also courage, because you don't, you don't necessarily know how things are going to turn out. For me, that's the journey of life. That's, I think, the, the reason I painted so many uh, foggy pieces uh, and pieces with roads. So uh, when I was in Chicago, I started uh, doing fused glass. And these are some of the pieces, uh, some of my early pieces. This is a typical uh, of my large bowls that I did. Um, that is the first piece of fused glass that I was really proud of. Um, and I brought it to an art fair. And I, I, I didn't see any sense in keeping it and not selling it. But I really didn't want to sell it. So I just priced it so high that nobody ever bought it. Um, so I still have it, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I do. But I was making uh, plates and bowls, fairly simple, functional work. Uh, and as I said, I got a lot of comments, but very few sales. Um, and at one point, I was, I was going to be in a big show. I made 25 bowls like this, and I didn't sell a single one. And I, I was uncertain how to price them. And I, I had a certain price in my head, and I showed them to an artist about a week ahead of time. It was probably a mistake, but he said, oh, no, no, you're undervaluing your work. You should raise your price. And I said, oh, okay, well, he, he's an artist. He must know what he's talking about. So I raised my price. And the first day, it was a two-day fair. The first day of the fair, I didn't sell a single piece. And I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I felt comfortable with. So I, the second day, which is, this is something you should never do, is play around with your prices during an art fair, particularly if somebody's already bought a piece. Um, but since nobody had bought one, I, I lowered the price back down and still didn't sell it. I was selling a few, I was selling some coasters and some simple things, but none of these sold. And uh, so in a couple subsequent art fairs, I lowered the price. And I, at one point, I, I just said, I, I got to see. I priced it at my cost, just the cost of the glass, not the kiln or anything else. My time still didn't sell a one. And it really made me think, what, you know, what am I doing wrong? Because people would come up and say how beautiful they were, but no, no follow through in terms of sales. So I, 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 it, that was one of my failures. Um, most of these became wedding presents to my nephews and nieces. <laughs> they all have one. Um, but I started thinking very critically about what I was doing. Um, and I, you, know, you could argue that this is really not that fancy. It was a couple stringers and a couple pieces of fret. And to a certain degree, the less time I spent on it, the better, because I, you know, I was being more efficient. So I had to think about what it meant to be an artist, in particular what it meant to bring something unique to my work. Because one thing I noticed as I did art fairs is my work looked a lot like the artwork in all the other booths. There wasn't a lot of difference between me and everyone else. Um, but I also realized that pieces like the kind of decorative pieces like this, you could buy in, in the United States we have Crate and Barrel. Do you have Crate and Barrel here? It's like a, a housewares store, um, plates, dishes, glasses, that kind of thing. Nicer, kind of, not, not high-end, but kind of nice, nice stuff. Um, Crate and Barrel, Pier One, or all these stores that you could buy things that looked almost identical to what I sold and priced for half of my cost because they would buy them from China and import them in. So, you know, I, I kind of realized what I was making wasn't necessarily what people were buying. And so I, I kind of stopped making anything for a while, and I just started trying to learn more. Um, and in, in this process, it was 2009, um, and I took a, I was in Chicago by then, uh, I took a weekend uh, workshop at a place in St. Louis called uh, Third Degree Glass Factory. And they had a, something called a weekend experience. You could take six four-hour workshops. And I thought, that's perfect. I'm, I'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and just kind of start to learn. And one of the classes I took was a four-hour workshop in painting with enamel on glass and, and doing it with layers. 
very, very simple thing. And in four hours, it, you know, it was a really, really simple project. But it immediately kind of lit a spark for me. And I started thinking about, oh my gosh, I could do so many, so much with this. So after the workshop was over, the, the workshop was given by a guy named Mark Salisbury, who I'm deeply indebted to. Um, and I went up to talk to Mark afterwards. I'd, I'd love to do this, but I want to do landscapes, and I want to do them in color. And to keep the workshop simple, they had only given us black enamel to do a very simple design. And so I said, I want to do color landscapes. And, and Mark had two, word, two pieces of advice for me. One is he said, stay away from color. When you get into enamels, you'll have a lot of problems with color. So stick with black. Uh, and I, I, didn't I didn't really question him on that. I knew there were enamels in lots of colors, so I, I, I kind of took it for what, what he said. And, um, but the other thing is he says, I don't think landscapes will render very well in this technique. So I wouldn't recommend landscapes as what, as what you paint. Okay, so there goes my idea. Um, but I... I didn't understand why they wouldn't render well, and I didn't understand why colors wouldn't work. So I spent about two years basically doing trial and error, making very small pieces, kind of maybe pieces the size of these, these blocks over here, and working with colors and working with different ways to do landscapes. And it took me about two years till I was happy with the work I was producing. And I did learn a couple things. One is some colors are very problematic, um, and particular reds and oranges, the chemicals in them burn out at high temperatures, the temperatures you need in the kiln. Uh, so they're very, very finicky and very difficult to get the way I wanted. And particularly the brand of enamels I was using had a maximum uh, temperature, uh, let's see, uh, probably of about 700 degrees Celsius, I'm, I'm guessing. And I was firing it more like 800 degrees, you know. And, and so I knew I was going beyond their recommended range. So it's not like I could call them up and say, what's wrong with your enamels? They would say, oh, you're using them wrong. But I had, I had to go to that temperature. Um, so the more I worked, the more I started to like, that's my, I'm behind. The more I started to like what I did, and then this was the first piece that I was really happy with. This is, an, this is a nine layer piece. Um, and it's done all in kind of black and gray. And there's a little bit of blue in there, but it doesn't show up well in the photograph. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very iconic scene uh, in Chicago on the, sh on the uh, shore of Lake Michigan. I was taken by a photographer friend of mine. The, the photo was taken by a photographer friend. And he let me use it for this piece. And I was really excited about this. And I, I, had, I told him, if you let me use your photograph, and if I make a piece and I sell it, I'll make a second one for you. So I made a piece, brought it to an art fair, and it was the first piece that sold. So I made a second one, and I finished it just before another fair. Uh, oh, maybe, maybe I'll bring it and see what happens. And, and that one sold. Um, and I, my, my friend eventually got the fourth version that I, I made. Um, but that was, that was encouraging to me. Number one, it was the first piece that I had made. It was probably about this size. Um, it was bigger than the small blocks I had made. And they were selling on a somewhat predictable basis, which was not my experience when I was making all my bowls. So I continued... Um, uh, making them continued, uh, just trying to experiment with the colors. Um, I really liked uh, the foggy effect that I was getting. Um, this is called Light Rain. It's another really early piece, um, and it's the first piece that I won an award for. Um, in 2013, I submitted it uh, to a show, and I was, it was a general art show. It wasn't just glass. In fact, they didn't have it. They had categories for ceramic and watercolor, and they didn't have a glass category. So my award was Multimedia Artist of the Year. Um, and I figured it was the closest thing that they had. And I, I, was, I was 
uh, surprised, uh, but very happy. Um, in 2014, I submitted this piece to the, um, the Glass Prize from uh, Warm Glass UK, and I won in the non-bullseye category. I thought it was very interesting. They had two categories, the bullseye prize and the non-bullseye prize. I, um, I would have picked a different name for that category. But, but these, these awards were... Uh, were really significant for me, and it really gave me a lot of confidence to kind of keep exploring, um, and felt, I felt like I was on the right path there. So most of you are glass artists, is that true? Is there anyone that's not familiar with glass art as a category? Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, people say, well, who are you, and... and uh, sometimes I'll say I'm an artist working in glass, but in more specifically, I'm an artist working in warm glass, or I'm a kiln form glass artist, which is weird because that makes it sound like I was in the kiln. Uh, basically, with uh, kiln form glass, we take glass when it's cold, we cut it into shapes, pieces, we assemble it when it's cold, and then it goes into the kiln, and we heat it up, and it melts together. So that's basically the fusing process. It's very different than glass blowing, where the glass starts at uh, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 1,300 centigrade. Thank you. Um, and you're manipulating it when it's hot. Um, very, very different uh, kind of process. But this is what works for me. I think because of my engineering mind, I like the planning, I like the cutting, I like all the things that you do before it goes in the kiln, and then it goes in the kiln and I go to sleep. You know, with, with hot glass, you, the magic happens right there in front of you. It's very immediate. You're forming this big ball of glass. But with kiln form glass, it's much more um, of, a, of a process. Um, so here's a picture of some glass that's kind of cold glass stack that's going into the kiln, and this is an example of uh, some fused glass after it, it's been through that process. My process today, even though I call it fused glass, it is um, it's quite different than what most people think of as fused glass. And even though I never took that casting class, I consider this half fusing and half casting. So what I do is I paint with enamel on layers of glass, anywhere from 9 to 13 layers of glass. Usually 9 because I have these stands made and, and they perfectly hold a piece that's 9 layers thick. I now have a, a, another stand which will hold 13 layers, but that typically I, I use 9. Um, and I mix the enamels myself. The enamels come typically in powder form. They're basically chemical pigments or colorants. So if you want to make blue glass, you add cobalt to clear glass and it turns blue. And if you want to make white glass, you might add titanium to clear glass and it turns white. So when you buy enamels, you're buying those same colorants in a powdered form. And then I mix it with a a liquid binder, usually some type of a thick, oily substance, uh, until it's, it's a uh, paintable uh, uh, consistency. Uh, if you've ever done uh, acrylic uh, painting, it's prob that's probably the closest thing I would say. So I paint with that on each layer. Then the layers go into my kiln at 600 degrees. Um, for just a short period of time. And what happens there is the oil burns off and it leaves all those chemicals behind sitting on the layer of glass, but they're permanently fused to the glass. So I can't scrape it off, I can't rub it off, I can, uh, it, it's really a permanent part of the glass at that point. Um, and so I, I, I uh, take that process and all the layers and then when they're done, I may do that again. So I may go through two or three firings on each layer. Uh, so in one firing, I may paint the tree trunks. And then I'll, I'll pre-fire those in. I'll go back in another firing and paint the leaves or the, the grass, a park bench. Um, and 
I don't have to worry about one object, the enamel from one object kind of messing up the other objects because they are already permanent. Um, so when all the layers are completed, then they're stacked in the kiln, and I surround it with brick on all four sides. And that is to prevent the glass from melting into a puddle. Because at this point, I heat it up to 800 degrees Celsius, and at that point, the glass melts to the consistency of honey. It's a very thick uh, liquid, really. Um, and at that point, all the layers fuse together. So this piece, even though it's nine, it was nine layers of glass, it's a single layer of glass now because all that glass is melted together. Um, and then once it reaches that temperature, the glass is very slowly cooled through a process called annealing. And I, I think most of you in the room know that that is just a process to keep uh, the glass from cracking or breaking. But in very thick work, the annealing process is very long. So these, the final firing for these pieces takes two to three days. Um, and like I say, it's partly fused, partly cast, because the, the stack of glass is sitting on a ceramic shelf, and then I surround it with brick. And really what I've created there is an open-faced, casting mold. I've created my own mold with no top on it. Um, so that's why I consider it part, partly casting. I'm going to walk through one of my pieces and kind of show you more step by step how it's done. So that we saw this piece earlier, it's called Follow Your Path, and I'll show you the final in a moment. But I, I generally start with either a photograph or a composite. I may, I may like the trees in one piece and um, the rocks in another, or I, I may take a piece and move trees around. I usually start with some type of imagery. Um, and then I, I, before I start doing anything, I identify what layers everything will be on. So you can see all these numbers up here are the layer numbers for all the various trees. And uh, in this photograph, the road the, the photograph was taken just after it rained, so there were puddles. You could see a little bit of water reflection in the puddle. I didn't try to represent that, so I took the water out. But I did want to, the, the photo, as you can see, is a little bit atmospheric, and I wanted to be real clear about where the edges of the road were. So I, I drew those lines in just for my reference. Because when you're working in multiple layers and you stack them all up, um, each each piece of that road have to line up exactly. In, in printing terms, that's something called registration. And if, if the pieces aren't in the exact same spot in each layer, they won't line up and it will look kind of wonky. So the, again, my engineering mind likes this process. I like taking a photo and decomposing it into layers um, and figuring everything out. Now, the main thing I write on here are the layer numbers. I'm also at the same time thinking about the color of objects. I'm thinking about the size of objects because uh, the objects should get smaller in the distance. I'm thinking about how much texture. You can see on these close trees, you can see the texture in the tree bark. And as the trees get farther away, the texture fades away. Part of that is because it's a little bit foggy, but even if you look at a forest, you can't see the bark on a tree that's that's uh, long distance away where it's very clear, close to you. The back layer of all my pieces is white, by the way. So it's white. So if it's nine layers, it's white, and then eight layers of clear. Um, so the white goes first. And then it, it works better in my mind if I then built upward. So the next layer is one, and the top layer, in this case, this is a 12-layer piece. The trees are on eight different layers. So those are numbered from one to eight, if I were going to do it now. But whenever I teach, I find my students get very, very confused by that. So I use this method when I teach, where it just seems to work better if it's the first time you've done it. But really, it doesn't matter. It's just a, it's just a numbering system. So that's, the, uh, that's where I start. Um, so this would be, in this case, layer eight. The, the one that's at the bottom and it's one that's 
that is the farthest away. You can see I didn't paint the entire layer. I'm really just point, uh, painting that focal point. And it's very, very light trees, um, very close together. And it's the, it's, the, it's the trees that are the farthest away. The background layer, even though it's white, so, that, so I've painted this in a very light gray. I'll paint that white layer even grayer. I'm sorry, even, it'll gray, but even lighter. So the difference in color between those trees and the background is very, very slight. And that, that helps kind of give that feeling of fog or that things are kind of disappearing into the distance. So this is layer eight. Layer seven, the trees have gotten bigger, slightly darker, and farther apart. So that's layer seven. <clears throat> Layer six, you'll hear this a lot, they are larger, darker, and farther apart, right? So larger because they're getting closer, darker because I, um, in, in, in this scenario, the, the darkest trees are in front and they get lighter and lighter as they fade away. And then farther apart because if, if you're looking at, a dist at trees from a distance, you might be able to see 200 trees, but if you're looking at trees right in front of you, you can only see one or two. So the closer they get, the farther apart they should be and the larger they should be. So that's layer six and I'll just kind of, you'll see the same pattern. Layer five, I've started adding a few bare branches. Layer four, layer three, again, larger, farther apart, darker. Layer two, and then layer one. Now I don't know if you remember in this piece, but there, there's, so I've got the white layer and then eight painted layers. I'm up to nine layers so far. The 10th layer has just some black bands on the top and the bottom. I normally don't do that, but this piece was already a very horizontal piece and I wanted to accentuate that horizontal plane. So I added a band at the top and the bottom, um, almost like it's framed, but not quite. Um, and so the, the, this will overlay the, the top inch and the bottom inch of each piece. So if I go back to layer one, that's why you don't see that I didn't bother painting the tops and bottoms of those trees. If you are looking in front of a tree that's just a few feet away from you, think about your eye as a camera lens. You have to, you'd have to look up to see the top and you'd have to look down to see the roots. You only see the center of that tree. So that is a, a, you know, that's a trick to get your eye to think, this tree is very, very close to me because I can't see the whole tree. Okay, so that's layer 10. And then on each layer, I add two clear layers. So when I say this is a nine layer piece, I've actually painted on seven layers and there are two, two clear layers on top. In the final firing process, because that brick has surrounded the glass, the glass has nowhere to move. And it's not, it's like thick honey. It's not sloshing around in the kiln. Um, so there's really no movement of the glass within that piece. But the top surface of the glass will have some movement to it. So at a very high temperature, if you've painted on the top, it may have some distortion to it. So I always cover, cover the glass with two layers of clear to avoid any movement on the top. Uh, I'm not saying you can't paint on the top, but I, I don't. In, in, in my work. That's just my style. So these are the uh, 10 layers, including the, the bottom white layer, all eight layers that are painted, and the banding on the top and the bottom. So I call this dry stacking. They've all been pre-fired, so everything's permanent, but they're still individual layers. And I will stack them at this point and say, does everything look right? I'll look to see if I've got, um, you know, gaps. I, you know, I, I might 
look at an area and say, well, I need more trees there, or I might need to fix something. Because once I, once you go through the final process, you, there's no fixing anything. It's, it is what it is. That, that piece of paper that I showed you with all the numbers on it, I print that to the exact size of the glass. So I often will paint, uh, I'll often put the glass right over the image and paint. It, it, it's a beautiful advantage of glass. Um, I, I think a, a fine oil painter would say, but you're tracing the image. <laughs> Maybe, but if he makes a mistake or she makes a mistake, she can fix it. I can't. So there's a, uh, I look at it, there's advantages and disadvantages with every medium. One of the advantages of glass, it is transparent, and you can do that. But I, I, I see that as an advantage, not a criticism, but that's just my viewpoint on it. So this is after the first firing, but you notice it's just the tree trunks. There's no leaves, no ground, anything like that. So now I'll go through that again, and I'll start to put in uh, leaves, ground, the road. I'll go through another pre-firing process on those layers until I have the whole piece complete. And I, I don't have pictures of the second firing, but this is the final piece. Um, and I, I really liked it. I, I mentioned that whole registration thing, and, and to point out one of my flaws, you notice right here there's a little place where the the line is not as continued. I did not plan that. That was a minor registration error. You probably wouldn't notice it if I hadn't pointed it out. My purpose, since you guys are all kind of glass artists, I mean, those are the kinds of things you have to think about. But this, the side of this road is actually a little bit of it's painted on all eight layers. So they all have to kind of line up as, as you get to the end there. So the whole idea about registration is, is uh, very important. Okay, um, I have a couple other pictures. This is not a great photo. This is just a quick iPhone photo in my uh, studio. Um, but I wanted to show you this in the kiln. So this is when this was in the kiln. And you can, so I'm, this is a top view. You can see it surrounded by brick. And the brick is both insulating, doing some heat insulation, but it's also keeping the, gla the glass from flowing. Um, this is a lot more brick than you probably need, um, but it's this, sometimes I do much larger pieces and then these bricks come in handy. So you can usually get by with a lot less. You do have to surround it with brick, so you lose some space in your kiln. So the, the largest piece you can make is usually a function of how big is your kiln. And like most glass people, we would always love a bigger kiln. Uh, so this is, my, this is the first kiln I bought, and this is the one I now use at home for pre-firing. Um, it, it has a brick top on it, and one of the disadvantages of having a brick top and something like this is every once in a while a little piece of brick will fall, onto the surface of the piece in that final firing. And then you've got to kind of dig it out with a, with a dremel or a drill and refire it and fix it. My larger kiln has a fiber top and you don't have those kinds of problems. So fiber top, in my view, a fiber top kiln is a much better option, um, at least for that final process. Um, so I thought I would uh, continue and just show you some other, uh, now that you know the process a bit, show you some of the other pieces uh, that I've done, and then um, show you some pieces that I have found as kind of inspiration uh, for me and, and other artists that are doing work with imagery, perhaps in some different ways. Uh, this piece is called Dancer in the Mist. Um, it The original image came from uh, an artist named Igor Zenin, who lives in Moldova, one of the former Soviet republics. And I, it was very hard to get a hold of him, but I did and got his permission to uh, use his imagery. Um, and 
um, I'll, I'll come back to this one, but he, he, his imagery usually has several kind of women tree figures dancing in a forest. Um, and when I got permission to, um, uh, to use his image, I, at that point I only had a 10 inch stand. I now have some wider stands. But to compress all that down into this size, the figures would be very small. And I, I didn't like that idea. So the first few pieces I did, these are 10 inches wide but 20 inches tall. And I was able to take one figure and really just focus on the one figure. Um, and so this is nine layers. The figure itself is actually on three layers. So like the there's an arm like this and an arm like this, and the, the, the torso and the two arms are, uh, form three, the top three layers that I painted on. Um, because it's all black, the, that sense of depth, you don't, you don't get that sense of depth as much as I hoped in the figure, uh, but then the background trees are on three different layers. So I've painted on, on six layers with the white background and two clear, two clear gives me the nine layers. So that's one uh, individual figure, and then I've done a couple pieces in larger formats um, with a whole uh, group of these dancers. Uh, and I don't always do landscapes. Um, I mostly do landscapes, but uh, sometimes I get, I don't know if I get tired, or I just kind of get interested in trying some other things. So I did a series of, I call them just cloister pieces. Uh, I, I like the, uh, of, uh, the image in a cloister of you know, these, goth, uh, these uh, gothic arches. You're looking down a hallway and you see arch after arch after arch. And that just seemed to be some imagery that would lend itself well to layered glass. Um, this piece uh, has a, fall, a far wall, uh, an outside room, and then an inner room, um, so I was able to get kind of this curved arch, a doorway, and then a window. The uh, photography kind of um, bled out the colors a little bit. The colors are actually, I think, a little bit better than what I have there. But that was one of, one of my non-landscape pieces. Uh, this is one I did just recently. I I generally tell people I don't do portraits and I don't do animals um, because I'm not very good at them. Um, but uh, I did this horse because I could do it more as a silhouette. I didn't have to paint a horse's face. Um, but I, I have seen people do wonderful animals painted in glass and even people's faces. I think that's just such an amazing skill and one that I don't have. Um, here's another um, non-landscape piece. Uh, this was done for an exhibit. The theme was the book Fahrenheit 451, which is a book on the topic of book banning and book burning. Um, and so it's called Hope for My Soul, and it's like it, 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 if they're going to burn all the books, and I could keep a certain number of them. What, which ones would I keep? And so the, 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 that was my inspiration for this. I will never do this piece again. <clears throat> I'm, in, in all the layers, it's very nice to put trees, but trees can be almost anywhere. So if they're off a little bit, you know, I, I don't like trees that are too normal. I like trees that are bent, that are gnarly, that, you know. This had Everything had to be so exact, not just for the registration, but you can't have a spine of a book that's taller at the bottom and narrower at, you know, uh, at the top. And in it, in the lettering, and it, it, I probably spent four times the amount of time on this piece than I ever have on another one. But I was really happy with the way it came out. Um, and I, was, I sent it to a gallery uh, for this exhibit, and and I was told it was bought by a psychologist who loves books, so it went to a good home. Lately, I have been um, uh, not doing as many foggy trees, uh, and I mentioned, you know, 
potential problems with color. So I spent some time starting to try to experiment with, with different colors. And there's some now, there are some new enamels on the market where the colors are uh, much easier to maintain at, at high temperatures. So for, all, for many years, my holy grail was to paint a beautiful sunset. Probably if there's anything I'm kind of focusing on right now, it's some, I'm catching up on my sunsets. So this is one of my recent sunset pieces. Here's another one. This is a very California type scene. Uh, and this is another one that, uh, it's not a sunset, but um, another one of my recent pieces called Smoky Moonlight, which is still kind of foggy. So I want to end with this, or start to wrap up with this quote. I know it's hot, I'm not going to keep you here much longer. This is from Kurt Vonnegut. Go into the arts. I'm not kidding. The arts are not a way to make a living. I, I can attest to that. Um, they are a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sake. So sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a lousy poem. Do it as well as you possibly can. You will get an enormous reward and you will have created something. I think that's probably my favorite quote about art. So I want to talk a little bit about some inspiration. And I, I mentioned the piece of glass that made my jaw drop to the floor. This is it. Or it was in, in this series. It's by a woman named Janet Kelman. Uh, she actually lived fairly close to me, which is I wandered into a gallery and there was one of her pieces. Um, these are made, um, she, she, she hires a gaffer, basically a hot glass person, to blow a big bubble in various colors. Then they open up that bubble and spin the blow tube until it turns into a plate, basically a flat piece of glass, which is where the term plate glass comes from. I don't know if you call it plate glass here. Glass windows used to be made by spinning glass. So she dictates the colors, then she gets these big plates called rondelles. She carves them into these sea fan shapes. Then she sandblasts them, and each ridge on here is another sandblast. So every sandblast takes away more and more and more. Then she puts it back in the kiln, warms it up to a point where it's bendable, and forms the shape. I mean, it's a it's a, it's a miraculous process, I think. Um, but for some reason, that uh, not consciously, but I remember seeing this piece probably 20 years ago. Five years ago, um, I went to my first uh, uh, conference of the Glass Heart Society. And um, it's an annual conference that is often held in the U.S., but uh, this next year it'll be at, in Murano. Um, and I met uh, Janet, a woman named Janet Kelman in a class I took. Um, didn't know her, didn't recognize her name. She's a very nice woman, and we, because we lived close by, we, we chatted. And she said she had a piece in a gallery in uh, Toledo, Ohio, which is where the conference was. And it was the same gallery that I knew that Dale Chihuly and, you know, Lino and all the, all the f really famous people were in. So I had wanted to go to that gallery anyway, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll look for Janet's piece. And I walked into the gallery, this long, long, narrow room. On the opposite wall, under a spotlight, I saw one of this. I saw a piece like this. And I said, oh, my gosh, I remember that piece. It was this instant recognition. And I made a beeline, and it was Janet's piece, the person I had just met. So I, I, I saw her a couple more times during the conference, and I'm sure I gushed and <laughs> embarrassed myself. But I told her how much this piece was the first piece of glass I'd fallen in love with. And uh, so we actually became friends. And I, when I drove home from the conference, I actually stopped in to see her studio. And she doesn't have a sandblasting 
uh, box, she has some blasting room. She suits up like an astronaut with a hose, and it's like amazing. But um, two weeks after the conference, she sent me an email, and she said, I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but someone who bought one of these pieces years ago just recently passed away, and I was informed that it was being sold at an estate sale this coming weekend in Illinois, and it turned out to be about a half hour from where I lived. So I went there um, and ended up buying it. It's the most expensive, and I know how much it, I bought it for like one-sixth of its value in a gallery. The, the people at the estate sale should never have sold it for that price, except for me. Um, <laughs> It, it, it'll probably always be the most expensive piece of glass I've ever bought, but it's on my dining room table. This this one in those colors, and it's 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 probably you could comfortably hold it like this. So it's it, it's pretty large. I uh, my friends are very irreverent when it comes to glass, and they call it the guacamole bowl. <laughs> so I showed them what Janet is doing these days, and this this is. These are some boats that she makes. So she pulls her own stringers with a vitrograph. She melts the, the uh, you know, melts that into sheets. Then she cuts them into sections. She reassembles them, fuses them back together, and then slumps them into uh, a boat. And um, they're beautiful. And I showed this piece to them, and they suggested that Janet put dividers so you could have your guacamole in one section, <laughs> your salsa in another section, and whatever. OK, uh, um, other artists that do imagery in glass. Uh, one of my favorites is Miriam De Fiori, who's uh, in Italy. And I think of any artist, her final result is very similar to mine. Or I, she's been doing it a lot longer than me. I'm very similar to her. And I, when I first saw her work, I assumed she was also painting. And she's not. If it, has she ever taught here in the UK? So it's a very intensive process. All of the branches are stringers that she pulls. And so this is all built up with powder, frit, and hand-pulled stringers. Very, very complex set of processes. Um, but I've done a number of winter scenes, and, she, and so has she, and I, I, I think she is wonderful. Uh, there's some Australian artists I really love. Uh, this is Ruth Oliphant. And if you notice the top, this is, this is not glasses fused together. She constructs these boxes, so she's got really three layers with about that much airspace in between. But she cr also creates these kind of three-dimensional images. And particularly when you see this in real life, you really feel like you can just drive your car through that town on that road. They're, they're, they're really outstanding. Uh, Jeremy Lepisto is an American, but he moved to Australia to uh, both study and work there. And his images are done with dry black powder. So he doesn't paint, he doesn't mix enamel with powder. He uses ground up black glass, which in that powder is very different than enamel, which is just the colorant without glass. Uh, but he manipulates the, um, the powder into images. And I, I not only like his images, but I like the way he presents them. This is another piece of his. Uh, very, very inventive ways of, you know, they're just not like, a rectangle like mine. Uh, April Surgeon, um, she's an American, and I, I love her work. Uh, if you're familiar with the process of cameo carving, like if you carve a cameo ring, you have stones with different colors, and you carve away. Well, she takes a sheet of, let me try to get this right, black glass on the bottom and a white glass on the top, and she fuses them together. And then she takes carving tools and carves away the white. And the more white she carves, as she starts to carve, it turns light gray. Uh, but her degree of, of control to get the shading on, on these pieces is just, they're all just amazing. Uh, Jeff Zimmer is uh, also an American who moved to the UK and is now a UK citizen. Um, and 
process-wise, he's probably most similar t to me in that he, he works with enamel on multiple layers. He displays them in a light box, so there's actually light coming in from behind. He doesn't use a stand, so his pieces would, would all be displayed on a wall. Uh, but I loved his, I love his soft kind of imagery. That's one of his, and this is another one of his. And um, he uh, came to uh, Chicago a number of times for a show there, an annual show called Sofa. And since I lived in Chicago, I had the pleasure of meeting him and talking with him a number of times. And um, another export from the U.S., uh, Jeffrey Sarmiento. He was actually born in Chicago um, and now is at the University of Sunderland, I believe. Uh, and uh, this is the first time I saw his work. These were on display in Chicago. These are layers of glass, again, fused together, but he, he does screen printing. So I'm, I'm painting basically by hand. He is using screen printing to apply the enamel, and then you get a buildup of imagery uh, through screen printing. Uh, this is another piece, which um, I can't remember the title, but the concept was capturing uh, knowledge out of an encyclopedia and preserving it in glass. So each of these images is from a page in an encyclopedia, which good thing is preserving it because I'm sure they probably don't print encyclopedias anymore with Google. Um, but the amazing thing about this is the, the size of it. The front face of this is eight inches, which would be about 20 centimeters square but it goes back for a meter. And it's just, it, it's really cool. I, I am guessing, I, I've met Jeffrey, but I, I, not, I haven't talked to him since I've seen this. I'm guessing he makes blocks and then maybe laminates them together. That, that's just a pure guess on my part. I could be totally off. We've been a very patient audience in a very hot room, and I thank you for that, and I thank you very much for coming. <laughs>